Um, but that food can come in the form of prana or ki energy. Go on. Your, uh, what I'd like to share with your readers, your viewers, is that there's so much scientific experimentation being done on this already, like scientific Kijong exploration, which has been put together by one of the heads of the Chinese scientific community, a, a Professor Lu Zinyung, and he talks about the state of bijou that people go into where they're living normal lives and they're not eating. Okay, where, where? very rare. Sure. Only drinking as well. Where are they getting their sustenance from if they're not getting it from food? Qi, the qi, the universal life force, or what we call prana, or if you're a religious person, you would say you are fed by the light of God, and yeah. obviously that's very hard to measure. This is nonsense. But with qi, it's not hard to measure. Th this is just... It's not th nonsense this is just you do If you research. don't eat, you die. But that's most people's belief systems in the Western world, and that's why these studies are so powerful and important now. See, every second second, a child dies of hunger-related diseases. Yes, look. And I've found in my research that you can apply the lifestyles that we are living as ambassadors of life to take care of a lot of world health and world hunger-related problems. I, I don't mean to belittle your, your beliefs, and I'm sure they're sincerely held, but there is a woman who is dead in Scotland as a consequence of following your well, principles. We, Yes, we don't really know what happened in that situation. Well, we know that the diary she, she left behind. We need to leave. Well, we don't need to leave it because we know that the diary that she left behind, that was found with her body, makes extensive references to your book and your ideas. She starved mm. herself to and death. Well, also, too, who controls the time of birth and who controls the time of death? There are people with very strong connections with the divine who feel that that is a contract between you and the divine. I think it's very important that people are well prepared because I hate the fact that there are people who could possibly do damage to themselves from following these type of practices. But we'd like to stress that we are not a cult. This is simply um, a sharing of information that will allow people mm -hmm. to take greater control over their health, their happiness, their vitality, if it is practiced um, and well prepared for properly. How many other people have died as a consequence of following this belief system? There was a woman in Australia who went into a coma and was taken off life support systems later when she was um, going through the 21-day process with a man called Jim Pesnak, and he's awaiting trial at this point. The concern is not that she couldn't live on light from what the police have been investigating because they've found enough information okay. now through other fields of research with okay. the yogis to say this is possible. Their concern Thank you. was, was he negligent in calling the right. police before okay. the um, ambulance beforehand? Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Don't try this at home, as they say. Uh, the Times is revealing evidence of massacres in East Timor. Uh, Labour is having a new purge of the left, according to The Guardian. The Daily Telegraph claims that British scientists have discovered a way of reversing the menopause with huge implications for female fertility. And a private memo apparently reveals that the Treasury is planning to vet ministers' speeches. That's it for tonight. We'll be back uh, tomorrow night. Until then, from all of us on the programme, good night. Get ready for the biggest thing on television in 200 million years. Walking with Dinosaurs, October on BBC One. Is it true about Danny? Sometimes the uniform can become a bit of a straitjacket, you know? Made me feel safe. Hey. Mike, what are you yeah. doing? Mike, what are you doing? Oh, this is really funny, yeah, really mature. How long are you going to leave it there, then? I don't know. Do when I'm hungry. Guys, what it's not doing, funny. Judy? Come on, Lewis, you little princess. I'm going to try being stuck in a car with it all day long. No, I don't. One second, please. Charlie Echo to 859. Go ahead. There you go. I've only got one cool one. A dark comedy from Ireland. I went down. Is this a dream? No. It's real. Ruby invites you to dinner in five minutes after a personal view from the Video Nation.
My brother has three toilets. One wife, one child. Two personalised number plates, four bedrooms and three toilets. And I'm a one-toilet guy, living in a three-toilet world. I've no need for three toilets. But that's not the problem. The problem is I have no desire for three toilets. I have no desire for a personalised number plate. It's a problem when you live in a world that is driven by that need to want. And it means I'm lacking. You know, genetically, genetically I'm not up to scratch, to survive. In terms of breeding stock, I'm not that good a catch. The drive that you need to achieve, the desire to acquire, This striving to success and to succeed, I don't have it. And it should make me unhappy. But instead it breeds in me a certain sneaking contentment. Everybody has one of these receptacles in their house. This is a uh, water carrier that's had its um, top chopped off, and it now doubles as a toilet roll middle holder. Every parent knows that toilet roll middles have um, inestimable value for their children. And if the children don't use them for modelling, then they're filled with compost and plants are grown in them. And then they're sort of either peeled off when you want to put the plant in the ground or they actually rot away so you can, you know, keep the roots bound for a little while. And we have this brilliant system in this house that not one is lost. And I'll show you how it works. Here we go. Now. If I set it right, it will land in the box. Couldn't be easier. Waste not, want not. The instinct to find a roof to put over our heads. Are you looking for a rural location or a garage? Like eating and then sleeping. So is this south facing? It is in the mornings, yes. Right. Is something we share with the rest of the animal kingdom except for animals that don't have heads, like worms. Houses tell you such a lot. I mean, this is obviously a single guy. Right, so you can, what, you just got a sort of feel for him? Well, if you look at his video collection. Right, all oh, right, yes. People Like Us, Monday at 10 on BBC Two. <laughs> Previewing the All Saints new film and getting in with the mob in Analyse This. Jonathan Ross takes the chair for Film 99 on BBC One shortly and at midnight in Northern Ireland. Well, an uncomfortable... An uncomfortable dinner party, a bakery mugging and a flatulent horse. Things are going from bad to fast in Seinfeld in 40 minutes on BBC Two after Ruby hopefully has more success. My guests tonight are Marion Woodman, Robert Bly, John Simpson and Tony Slattery.
I just want to say who John Simpson is because we have two American guests here. Will you be Canadian? A, Canadian. Canadian. We've got one Please American. One Canadian and one, one Minnesotan. That this is John Simpson. I never say this in the beginning of the show, but just for your sake, um, he's reported and his yeah, because I don't know 101 countries he's reported from. Interviewed 120 emperors, monarchs, presidents, dictators, prime ministers, and other despots. 29 wars, uprisings, revolutions. 30. Yeah, and he just came in from so. Libya this morning to oh, be with us yes. here. Good Lord, yes, he did. Well, Do you think Gaddafi's got a personality disorder? I think he's got a something disorder, but I don't <laughs> know whether it's his personality. Yeah. What were you reporting? It was very funny. It was on television. Oh, what about the car? Yeah. Oh, he's designed a car. He's he uh, he Gaddafi. stayed. Uh, he stayed. You know, he's he's got this sort of, um, tent in the desert, and he kind of wanders around there. And Gaddafi sat up and designed himself a car, and now it's yes for the he very rich he, Libyans to purchase. Uh, yeah, well, or anybody. I, I I expect. I mean, if it ever gets made. Oh, it's not made yet. Well, it's there's just a prototype. On the drawing board? No, there's a prototype. We saw it. Uh, we saw it actually being driven along. I mean, it get, it can go, you know. Right. On and uh, gas. Ah, uh, well, no, not unexplained. What's the Nobody point of the pointed thing at the beginning and end? And uh, safety. Safety. Uh, safety. Within milliseconds, they said, um, electronic defences can be Whoa. erected Whoa. within the car. Whoa. So milliseconds. What like like mean? warfare electronic. electronic. I suppose so. Yes. What? Yes. Yeah. Like, like warfare. Like but what is an electronic defense? I mean, no I idea. Nobody explained this <laughs> at all. And, and I, you know, I mean, if you're like me, you don't, you just write that down. <laughs> yes, that's right. Leave it, you know. <laughs> but he is, um, he is barking. But you love barking. Well, the, the, I mean, I, yeah. He there's barking? Yeah, barking. Man. Barking. Oh, barking. Barking my, barking my, barking. He, you know, I mean, the world's all full of people like Tony Blair, isn't it? All sort of terribly, you know, nice and 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 and, and safe and safe and you know everything they do is kind of well planned out in advance. Everything they say has been issued as a press release ten minutes earlier. So do you and find it refreshing to I be with I think it's Gattel? marvelous to have nutters. <laughs> I mean, I just Where's think, too yeah. far? Like, would you say I mean is like one step too far? Well, I mean, in the sense of being a mass murderer, is yeah. probably a step <laughs> beyond you okay. know where we but feel who's a, who's, comfortable. Who are you with. comfortable with? As a, well, as I'm a comfortable terrorist. with Gaddafi. He does. I mean, he does. He's you know. I mean, I'm sure he's done all sorts of things he ought not to have done. But I'm. I feel quite. Uh, Quite comfortable with Gaddafi. I, I, that's the level I would like to pitch it at. Right. You know. And now, can I segue on to Robert and Marion? Because oh, please. All right. Segue. But we'll be back segue to you, um, Robert, and it's and Marion. But let me talk about Robert first. Yes, of course. Because um, Robert, among being a award-winning poet and ri have, having written many books, is famous for writing Iron John, which you reviewed. Indeed. It, it brought to consciousness the men's movement. Well, I I don't know. I always thought men and women uh, a lot. And uh, I tended to use fairy tales as uh, a base because it hasn't been uh, involved with uh, Jung and Freud and so on. But the women were the ones who really respond when you tell fairy tales and they come back with all sorts of things. And I'd be teaching them and I'd have uh, 40 women and 20 men and the women would talk through the whole thing. Finally, I'd say to the men, why don't you say something? So finally, I decided I'd have to have one story for women on Saturday and one story for men on Sunday. Is this, is this like Grimm and uh, Hans Christian Yes, Anderson exactly. Right. And, 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 and you're translating the fairy tales as a metaphor of where we're at now? Well, then the problem is how to relate it to what we're doing. Yeah. How to relate it to I mean, these stories are three to four thousand years old. And were they originally written to be a metaphor for how we live, do you think? Well, you think Grimm it's a big difference, that? you know. Uh, the worst thing that happened maybe a hundred years ago, we gave the fairy tales to the children. In Norway, for example, they were for adults. And they were only told after the uh, children have gone to bed. But around 1850, we started to give all kinds of things away to children, as if there's nothing in the stories but things where children would respond. Chances are very strong that, that uh, Freud and Jung and Karen Harney were not the first psychologists in the world. Uh, 20,000 years ago, they were men and women. Why didn't who, they just call a spade a spade? Why did they have to cloak it in Red Riding Hood? Well, because in the first place, you can't put what you learned in a book, because there weren't no books. Oh, so it was And spoken. if you did, well, some machos would come along and burn the library anyway. Some so more? what machos would come along and burn the library? So your one possibility is is you take a lifetime of experience uh, and you put it into a story with the details so vivid that everyone will remember it for centuries. And what would these fairy tales teach you? Uh, they often have a beginning in the story that we're telling right now. It has to do with a boy, Ivan, who is um, a beautiful boy. His father's a merchant, which is a fairly big operation in Russia. 
he marries, but the mother dies. And so therefore the father, who's going to be gone a lot, hires a tutor and a stepmother, or has a stepmother. And the stepmother falls in love with Iran. The son. Thinks he's very handsome. This is very Freudian. Yeah. So you get a little hint there's going to be a little trouble here. But basically, as Marion would say, the problem in the beginning of the book is announced. There's an absence of the genuine feminine. There's an absence of the loving mother. And, and father's the, gone all the time. And what's the repercussion? What's the lesson we should learn? If the, Then you have to see, mother. is that your kind of a situation? If that's so, then you'd follow this story very well, carefully. Well, John had an absent mother. No, oh, my mother and father split up when I was seven. I mean, it doesn't seem such an amazing No, but then you had now, to, this is very... Uh, I did have to choose which one I was going to go with. Which one did you choose? I went with my father, actually, uh -huh. which does seem a bit weird, but, but it was just that I worked it out. My mother had two children by a, 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 a former marriage, and it seemed to me a sort of fair division of the spoils if I stayed with my father, who wouldn't have any children. At that stage, I regarded it as being a good idea to have children, you see. And uh, <laughs> my, the look on my father's face uh, was a very complex one, which uh, it took me some decades to understand <laughs> as he realized that life was over for him. It's a perfect fairy tale situation. And did your father have something of the maternal in him so he was able to provide something of the... He was a good cook. A good, that's good. That's very good. But he lived with another man, not in a sexual way, didn't he? Who was yes, a great he did, mother. Yes. So he yes. did have the feminine. Oh, yes. No, it was all the. Uh, so that would be a situation, mm. and there'll be nine or ten possibilities out of that. There'll be nine or ten stories that'll go that way. Then there'll be others in which you the went story with the mother. Of John. Mm -hmm. And all those are different, so one has to look for the story that's right. And do you think it gives comfort if there is a fairy tale that we can identify with it? It's like a road, it's like well, a blueprint into your psyche? Well, it's a road map. I mean, how, why, how do you get to Chicago, you want to go to New Orleans and there's no road map? And besides, uh, when you see it turn up in the story, then you say, well, that's not my fault. This is in the story. You know, I shouldn't blame myself anymore for what I did or what happened to me. So you just say, but isn't that passing the buck? No. Nope. Is, I think it's eating the buck. Marion, by the I way, is a Jungian therapist. So and let's let hear your side. What happened with you when you were very small? Well, when, when I was very small, I really was a father's daughter. Uh -huh. And um, What happened to your mother? She, oh, she was present. But I had a mother like many other people now who was unhappy being a woman. Mm. She didn't love her own body as a woman. Mm -hmm. How did you know that? I felt it the way she rejected my body. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I really felt that I was cut off at the neck. I had a head and hands, but all of the body was unconscious. It, it was not good to be in love with your body in any way. I mean, it's one thing yeah. to think with your head, something totally other to feel And do you think every woman body. has this or every human has this? No. Uh, uh, that they we're can disconnected? Have it. In the culture that we're living in, because the Judo Christian uh, religion has separated the body and said the body is evil, sexuality is evil, it's the snake, it's the separation that makes the body the part to be discarded. The head becomes everything. And the upshot is people are living without the passion which makes them want to live. You know, I want to live. I think many people are trying to be happy, but they haven't got any idea what that means. What's the connection between this and that later addiction uh, you got into with uh, anorexia and not eating? If you think of the looking for spirit, you know, and yearning for that bright light and that spirit that quickens life and... Um, the thing know, that's promised you... at the end of the fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ab but it's, it's promised by romantic love, too. And you certainly get closer to it if you are starving, if you are running and dancing. You know, starvation takes you into an aura that you don't have otherwise. So it was that yearning for spirit that took me into anorexia and the yearning to be perfect. And many, many people are addicted in one way or another to that perfection. But at the core of that is a death wish. You know. How did you find that out? Well, I f finally had to face the fact that I was dying. 
and I think they you had, had anorexia then. Yes, she was right. dying, mm -hmm. and I had to work. Uh, in my my work has been with anorexics, bulimics, alcoholics, ad addicts of many kinds, and each one seems to me eventually has to come to that place where they recognize that they don't want to be in life. They don't want reality. They are trying to escape, and that's where the death wish comes in. I mean, any <coughs> any alcoholic knows that if he goes on as he's going, he's going to die. Do, do you, Tony, this <coughs> is relevant yes. to you because yeah. you, you're. Do you mind me saying? No, so we like. Well, you know what I'm saying. No, no, well, no. But you are. You you have a. And you had an addiction problem. Uh, no, well, funnily enough, um, it wasn't. Um, you have to fulfil certain uh, requirements to be uh, labelled uh, by the Home Office uh, an addict, and um, I wasn't uh, addicted as such. I was just uh, consuming uh, toxic amounts of uh, central nervous system uh, stimulants, uh, uh, which uh, Is it a death wish? Like no, absolutely. Said? There was no suicidal ideation. What were they? Though? Um, it was a uh, cocaine, methyl, phenidate, anything which would uh, make uh, uh, me stay awake, um, and that exacerbated a, a pre-existing um, depressive disorder, which is uh, like genetically predisposed in my uh, family, anyway. And so it was a, a bit of a toxic uh, cocktail, and uh, it was like gasoline uh, on the fire. Um, but I was doing it on my own in a very uh, withdrawn and apathetic and isolated state. So well, you're describing a road map to death. Tony. Yes, but I didn't want to die. I no, wanted, you thought you didn't want to die. No, I knew I didn't want to die. Mm. Um, I wanted to, there were two things I wanted. I wanted to, um, it was a specific, um, and uh, the psychiatrists uh, I've seen um, can't quite put their finger on it, and I know we all want to be exotic and say, oh, you know, this is a strange condition, um, and uh, some of it was obviously self-indulgence and selfishness and my fault, but, and some of it um, was out of my control. Uh, but I, there were two things I wanted. One, I wanted to, felt, uh, wanted to feel like um, I wanted to know what it felt like to be insane. Insane? Yes, absolutely. I wanted to, it was, it was the, a search for insanity. And also, it was um, to um, make uh, me uh, loathe myself uh, more. They were the two specific uh, focuses of what I Why wanted to do. Why did you want to loathe yourself more? Um, because... He's a comedian. <laughs> because, um, I, do, I, I don't know, that's a can of worms, I guess. So maybe, maybe now it's time for some... Uh, Therapy. <laughs> Help me here. Would you, would you well, I just want to say that no ad addict in the first stages of addiction would admit that they had a death wish. They don't know it. Consciously, they sure. do not know it. It takes a long, long time. It seems to me you have to be on your knees at the wall sure. in order to say, I don't want to live, or I do want to live. Sure. There's a choice. Sure. And a lot of people choose not to live. Sure, absolutely. Would you accept the idea that inside you there was one person who wanted to die and one person who didn't want to die? I, I, yeah, that's an interesting yes. duality. Yeah. I mean, there's a great thing that Jung brought forward, which was a little different, but the greatest thing he brought forward is that there is someone inside you who is more intelligent than you are and sees more. And that one can't communicate with us because we're all big ego types, so therefore uses dreams and so on. But in a certain way, this one communicated to you by having you uh, drink a lot of dangerous stuff. Yeah. And you were meant to pick up that this one wants to die. Yeah. You picked it up, apparently, since you're still alive. I guess so. I think I was uh, pulled back just in time. Mm -hmm. I, I, can I just ask a question? Sure. Do you find um, more and more, uh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you no, off because no, no, I'm tying this in. It's very intelligent. It's very interesting yeah. that that would happen. That there's more uh, grief now in, in, uh, as we approach the millennium that more, or, or it's just more people are publicizing it because it's very vogue No, to I say. don't think it's anything. No, not this. I just right. mean a, a few years ago you wouldn't have had the audacity to even say that. Um, but are people more unhappy or are people substituting more things because of some I don't we're know. Coming I don't to the end of of something. Something. We're coming to the end of something. Oh, and people it has are to be really frightened. Why? Terrified. Because they're afraid to give up the past. They can see that everything is disintegrating. I can't tell you how swift the drop has been that way. There's been a catastrophic drop in the United States. In what? In cultural standards, in the ability to express language decently, to have wonderful ideas in it, to read seriously. All of that's in a heavy decline. And, uh, and everybody denies it, especially the people in the media, because they're involved in making everyone feel they're good. The ones responsible for it, yeah. Yeah. And uh, TV, of course, has had a tremendous... Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the, this very program is a, in the process of continuing it. But um, don't you think this television program, sorry to be up my own rectum, but, uh, you know, it can also be used, <laughs> as he does, you know, how would we know what uh, poisonous dictator is sure, sitting I on agree, his ass I in agree, Yugoslavia I, I without agree. this god 
yeah. you know, blessed media. I'm just but saying there's been a fantastic decline, and we all know it. And so there's a grief way down in here about the possibility of losing a lot of European culture, a lot of American culture, a lot of culture. There's, been, there's a grief. I mean, it has nothing to do with the millennium. It's, uh, it's like a person who's, who's lost uh, children, husbands, wives. Do you, what, do you, of do course you've got to feel grief. I, d I don't, actually. I, d I don't recognize either myself or my friends or the society I work in um, and live in in these kind of sort of tremendous terms of being right on the edge of everything. I mean, I... I don't you think your, your friends have declined somewhat from watching television? I mean, and your, the children well, and all of this? television... No, I don't. You don't? I don't know that the world's any more violent than it was in the 1940s. Well, the I'm 1930s. not talking about violence so much as a decline in the inability of humans to be gentle with each other, to... That's gone. To that's feel increased, <laughs> surely. Surely. It is the world. Isn't there a huge shift in consciousness in terms of letting go of tribes, letting go of nation states, letting go of even international connections? And recognizing that the planet is the next stage. That and, I think and is true. A I do think that's consciousness. true. Yes, yes. So that, there's you know, a sort there's of terrible sameness of... coming over us as a result, yes, which that, may be yeah, that's... part of that decline of, of a huge what? A, sameness. A, sameness, a terrible sort of homogenization, kind of yeah. homogenization and, which and goes and on. And terrible fear as a result. I mean, I come I from don't Canada. See very much fear about well, it. I I just feel that there are many smaller countries that are feeling their identity being taken away from them and there's nothing they can do to stop it. It is going to happen. I just go back to that idea that Physically. we're not actually more savage with each other. We're, we're actually rather, rather better with each other. There are fewer dictatorships now. There are fewer, there are fewer um, if, if many bad uh, violations of human rights, but not as many as there used to be. The world is actually, in some ways, a rather easier and better place. How can place. you look there at are... the news from Indonesia and say something like that? Well, I don't mean to say that everywhere is better, but um, I could say to you perfectly well that we could look at places which we've always associated with violence and terror and horror, and you don't, you don't find it there. Latin America doesn't have a single military dictatorship in it. Even the Middle East is starting to be... Uh, to be uh, infused with the notion that people can actually elect governments and that governments ought to do what, what people want them to. But if the governments are doing well and the individual people are feeling, uh, uh, being swamped in, as in China with uh, pollution everywhere, and, uh, what if the governments are doing fine and uh, the people themselves are going to hell really fast? What do you think about well, that? Well, I, don't, I under, actually don't, again, don't recognize yeah. that as a, as a kind of um, photograph of the, of the end of the century. You think that globalization is going to help the people in China and in uh, Indonesia? Well, I think, I think it may, yes. Mm -hmm. I think well, it may. something wants to say, but I just want to say that, that you know, we're, no. it's time to grieve yes, when hundreds sure. of languages are disappearing when it's hundreds of mm. small tribes with their souls and their mm. individual, when all those are going. That's never happened before. I mean, these people have remained here for 500,000 years, and it's unbelievable how but many are disappearing. But if you stop it, we're Quit. still going to be with tribes. But resources of soul and resources of civility, and they're going. But all of these resources of soul and resources of civility, all of those things that you were talking about earlier, existed at a time when, when simultaneously, People were being tortured to death in large numbers, where there were vast numbers of wars going on, far more, far, far more than there are at the moment, when the, when the whole culture of, of, of society was to kind of accept that, to go along with it. Nowadays, even, even in the most backward of countries, we realize that there's something wrong with governments that treat their people like that. What is it heading for? Well, I tell you what it isn't heading for. It isn't heading for the Spanish Inquisition, and uh -huh. it isn't heading for the SS, and it isn't heading for, for uh, Stalinist approaches to things. It, life may be coming more bland, but it's also actually becoming a lot easier for the great majority of people. But what do you think, when you use the word bland, John, is there not something that's asleep in a bland person? Is a bland person interesting? Are they happy? Are they passionate? You know, from the feminine point of view, the, the thing that I worry about is the disrespect 
for the embodied soul, the disrespect for the planet itself, you know, rape the planet, rape the body, rape the health. And, and I just see people going so fast and so uh, into technology and so far out of heart that I... I but tremble. surely what you want, you just want to pick the good bits out and you want to keep the best. Of, I mean, it's entirely natural that you should, but keep the best of the past and, and pick the good bits out of the present and chuck the rest away. But it doesn't work, work like that. that. When, when, Robert, when you do your workshops, and Marion, when you do your workshops, what do you do practically to get people back in touch with their uh, soul? With their what? Soul? With their what? Oh, soul. Sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think I said? I thought you should get them in touch with their asshole. <laughs> Always lowering the tone. That's, 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 that's very English. English. It, English. It, it is, it is. But in terms of just phonetics <laughs> and Just to remind people, it's not an American show. Yeah, these are show. lexical items. You know, that's the only it's way important. we have to... Uh, Do you feel it's separated from your soul? Uh, my, uh, my Seriously, soul. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I believe in the, the nature of the soul. Yeah, right. There he is. That's, so right. what was that's what, what happens. He's overeducated. Uh, what, what, what would you call soul, John? Uh, um, what would I call the soul? I, well, I, I, I regard myself as a, as a reasonably uh, liberal, centrist, uh, humanist. Uh, and uh, agnostic, and um, I am um, vaguely distrustful of uh, anyone who um, uh, believes in God or organized religion, because I think it is tantamount But I'm not to... talking about organized religion. Sure, the soul. I'm talking about the soul. That's, that's a metaphysical concept as opposed to something which is empirically observable. You don't think it exists? Um, well, I can't see it. Um, it's never been uh, proved to exist. When you look into my face, do you see nothing? I see a very lovely uh, woman who's, uh, who's you know, an expert in her field, uh, who I hardly know, and who is extremely uh, courteous. Um, as for seeing into your soul, I wouldn't go uh, that far because I don't think I would have that depth well, of vision. There's something there, though, isn't it? There's something. It's not just. They're not just a set of features that are that are making. No, of course not. There's a, there's, there's, there's a brain. I'm, I myself would say that I, I'm a very optimistic man, and uh, in general, um, I. I I, I had a good time in college. I had a good time doing this and this and this. And um, I feel confident about things in general. That doesn't mean I have a soul. That doesn't mean that I can really feel something. So one of the first things I had to do was to be able to feel some grief over the losses in my own life. Um, Why, you and didn't then begin to think about, hmm? You didn't feel grief at the time? No, that's right. People die. So when you People... get older, one of the things that happens is that you can actually look back and see what you have lost. And I could see what I had lost because of my father being an alcoholic. I had no feeling of that at all during the time that I was with him or that I was in college. It was 10 years afterwards when I realized what it meant to have an alcoholic father, which means that, um, you know, he, what he loved most was the alcohol, not my brother or myself. And therefore, we ended up being unloved. I was an unloved person who was optimistic. Great, that's an American. That's, hmm? a, that's the American dream. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so <clears throat> one of the things that happened in Vietnam, you know, is that we didn't really grieve over the, uh, the I mean, an American didn't grieve over the dead in the Civil War. That became apparent when they put on that documentary in the Civil War. We didn't grieve over the people who uh, died in the First World War. 100,000 men died in one day. And as Michael Mead, who was teachers with me, used to say, if you don't grieve over the bodies, you leave them there on top of the ground and they start new wars. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't grieve for the Vietnamese, the, our people who died in Vietnam. Uh -huh. the Vietnam the, we asked the soldiers to do the grieving. And actually, as you know, more soldiers, American soldiers, committed suicide after the war than died in the war. That means that they were to do the grieving. And we would just go on being happy and getting our television shows and stuff like that. Is that true? That yeah, more true. died? That's true. Died. It's a terrible yeah. thing, but that's it's true. true. Anyway, so I think that the soul has got something to do with um, understanding and developing grief in oneself. But there have always been unpopular. wars. Was, was there right. not grieving then? Well, I know. I think people knew how to grieve much more in the past than we know now. But there's a, there was a newer sensibility. I, people didn't grieve over the 30 years war, the 100 years war, all the other, the, the Napoleonic wars. They didn't grieve then. They were just We have no to right be... to say that. You don't know that. Well, I, I think they were just glad to be free of them. Uh, and the idea that you had to worry about the enemy, the dead enemy, I think, was something that is relatively new. Well, I think we're grieving about our own dead. How, how does it come about that they turn to you and, and a man's movement emerges? 
Or I don't know. I have no idea how did myself. That start? As I say, I started teaching women, and finally the men said, "Where's the story for us?" And I said, "Well, okay." I went through the Grimm Brothers, 238 stories. Only six of them were for men. First one I found was. What Iron were the Tom. men lacking? I mean, women finally got their power. When I met men for the first time, and I'm a loner. I lived alone for years. What I made alone. you call together a group of men? What would inspire you? I was earning a living. I didn't decide not money? to teach in a university. Right. I decided to do weekend workshops with men and women, and then later with men. And the and men said, we want what? No, I did. the men got all together, and I was stunned at the amount of suffering and grief there was in them, and particularly the distance from their fathers. And How that many just came out of the workshop? The, hmm? That just came out? That came out. I had no sense of it. You would start to talk to them, and first of all, the old men would talk, and then they would say, God, you know, I can't tell you how much I lost in my life because I was working all the time. I don't, I'd had no relationship with my wife, and uh, my children I hardly know, and, and this would go on this way, and they'd start to weep and so on. And then the young ones would wait two or three days, and then they'd say to themselves, am I going to look like that when I'm 65? Don't even know who my kids are. Again, Robert, I totally agree with the emotional side of what you're saying, but men got to work and fish got to fly. You know, uh, whatever that song goes, it's got to happen. If my father, d he should have gone to the office, you know? He stayed home instead and ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> Women come into my workshops because they are not able to go on living. If this is all there is, they are not interested in going any further. But all there the is war. This their... is a fabulous world. <laughs> it's a fabulous world. You don't find world. a husband? But... Go to Papua New Guinea. This is a big place. Yeah. But Tell if... them to wake up and smell the roses. If you cannot experience it from inside yourself, it's one but great how big, can they empty turn mess. Turn to you, Marion. How do you help them? I work through dreams. For one thing. To find what they really yearn for? Is yes. that what we're looking for? If you believe that the dream is a gift from the one the inside eternal. more intelligent. You mean yeah. people one can't find their own happiness? That's news to me. Not talking about ego, talking about soul. Mm. The dream is like the fairy tale, uh, the soul story. Telling you what the, what it wants. And it will tell you what it wants. If you cannot hear it, it will go into your body and come out as and a kill, symptom. And also kill you, yeah. The, and our culture is rampant with autoimmune breakdown. Now, why would the body turn against itself? That is an extraordinary situation. Because surely we've just, we're just looking at our own navels all the time. I mean, these people that don't have enough to do. But you can only run so far, John, and then you say, I cannot see any point in running any further. I am not living. This, this, is, this is a sort of um, a theoretical. What about um, the sort of biochemical psychiatric aspects of our it all comes emotional here. dysfunction? Well, we know how can that they they're be connected. Sure, you see, but they, how, they, but we now know through psychoneuroimmunology that the image that is coming in, yep. that, that is being fed in, has is picked up by the neurotransmitters and changed into chemistry. Sure, and sometimes that needs radical intervention. It does. Uh -huh. more, it, than, more than therapy. Yes. I feel uh, much more 19th century about all this. I, I think it's a matter of character and how you respond to these things. I don't... I, I really don't... Stiff upper lip is where you're going. I'm sorry to say that. I know I'm wearing a tie and a suit, and, but I do, I do. I'm still yeah. slightly What, if you were in a yashmak, stuck, you'd have a different philosophy? I'm still philosophy? slightly stuck, John, on uh, your very um, benign personality profile of uh, Gaddafi, considering he's, uh, you know, a dangerous uh, despot and a tyrant and um, uh, an apologist for uh, terrorism, and yet you said, well, you think he's okay. That's well, what I you said. I think it was okay. Well, did, if, I did, if I did, I, I meant in a in a, a mental health kind of way. I, I think no. I mean, I don't like those kind of people. I don't like people who who speak as he did the other day um, in a kind of positive way of the IRA putting bombs in in London. I, oh, that that kind of thing. He just, said that. Or mm -hmm. yes, he did. Yeah. Well, he's a nutter, so he says these things. I, 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 you, I, you just said you didn't think of him in a mental health way, but then you said he's a nutter. I don't. That's a sort of <laughs> paradox. <laughs> Way. Well, it's quibbling over words. But, yeah. but, but, uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to like <laughs> what I do, <laughs> yeah, because he I, mimes on the news every <laughs> night. I, the thing is that I, uh, I just I feel that it isn't my job to go around the world saying that 
some people are yeah. right and good, and we should therefore like them and support them, and others, and I'll give you a list, are evil and bad, and we should hate them. And I, I believe in going and trying to find out what they're really yeah. like, rather than just getting my information from President Reagan sure. or, 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 or whoever. I want to argue with John on this question of character. Because and that's something that very fortunate people say. Um, not necessarily in the 19th century, but right. all you have to do is have Put character. The knife down. <laughs> <laughs> all you have to do is to have character. Uh, but, um, you know, try saying that to the um, uh, indigenous tribes in the United States that have been wiped out by uh, very uh, lucky uh, English and American people. This business of, uh, uh, of character solving things is less and less true. I, I just get so sick of the notion that we're all victims, that, that we've all, every time you, you trip over, it's got to be somebody else's fault, that, that you should, uh, there's always somebody else to blame. It was my father, it was my mother, it was society, it was the whites that came and burned down my teepees. I, I you know, that, that is no doubt objectively entirely accurate. It just is not somehow enough. What do you say, to lie back Marian, on that. What do you well, say? I, I agree with you on that, John. That the person has to take responsibility for their own life. But a person who is down and out can't. But there's a duality. We need to draw a strict uh, dividing line between uh, what is um, self-indulgence and appetite yes. and greed yes. and what is pre-morbid, um, perhaps genetically predisposed yes. psychiatric no, illness. I, so you can't, you can't aside, say to a schizophrenic who's, who's, who's lying in a shop doorway, oh, get, get, get up, yeah, get up. some character, no, you know, no, sort of I, snap out of it. You just can't. And you, I, can, you know, you can say to someone who's, who's uh, just doing too much coke and down string fellows every night, you can say, oh, for God's sake, get it together. But you know, you're not even talking about the extreme. He's talking about a country that is and they're talking about a country or a, a, a world that's bereft of something lost of a soul that's lost yeah, of a that's, grief that's that we're carrying that's let's come back say. we're not you know, doing can the I workshop go on, um, that's what i want to say sure. we are talking about the loss of soul you know the rational position the rational position i hear very clearly but there is a passionate position where I want life to have meaning. I want to live my reality. And all the reason in the world will not convince me of, of that, that I can live in, a, in that world of reason. It isn't that simple. Things it aren't is, that simple. But John, you know? I'm not oh, saying girls. it is. Uh, but I am <laughs> saying that the feminine is the giver of life. That is not simple. To love life, to accept life as a birthright is not simple in our culture. Most people cannot accept it. They really can't. And they are depressed and angry because they can't. And if you're wondering and about that, why a men's movement comes war. along, it's because all the men have been on this raft. And they really are separated from the divine feminine. And what is the divine, the divine feminine? feminine? I don't know. The story I, I, says there's 30 know. men and women on the golden boat. What and is the divine feminine then, Tony? I'm, I'm, you will, I'm, I know you can answer this. Okay, well, come uh, in, baby, come okay. in. What is the divine yeah. feminine? feminine? Okay, I'm, I, I'm a bit don't stumped. Bluff. I'm no, I'm stumped. Have a little I water. Don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't take, know. I'm, so, right. I'm sorry. I don't know. Haven't you ever been in love? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, didn't you see the divine feminine? Um, what in in terms of beautiful vaginal contact? Didn't or? didn't you <laughs> didn't you get sort of charged up in a way that you'd never been charged up before when you were in love? Oh sure, yeah. And did you see your woman as radiant? Uh, well, if it was a woman, yes. <laughs> We're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> it's been, it's just likes his dog. I mean, it's been, that, that it's been, you know, it's been different things, but uh, you know, the um, yes, being in love is a is a strange uh, state. Yes, that is true. He's very um, you're dealing with a man who's very twisted, and his twistedness makes him brilliant. <laughs> no, do you know what I mean? If you untwist him, he may become a bore, or he just may be healthier. There's How, a good question. You twisted. I do think you're very twisted. <laughs> yeah, you. I think your synopsises are twisted. I think you can't answer a question directly. No, but let's but go he, back. He and but he's got a fun. No. Yeah. Oh. Can I say something really unforgivably rude? <laughs> yes, you certainly Coarse, can. vulgar, no, nasty, no, that'll no, even no. upset everybody. I think you two are like priests in the Middle Ages. I think you're like the Church of England clergymen in the 1850s. I think it's just the current, the current thing 
to, to, to preach. I'm that like, makes me angry. Well, I'm sure Go it for does. It, that it is collective. Answer. You are accusing me of going with the collective value system. I have been through illness. I have been through the kind of hell that John, that Tony has been through. And I have, I have fallen on my knees at the wall and said to myself, do I choose to live? Do I choose to die? You I gave have said up these absolutely at any other stage in than in the 1990s. On. In the in the 1850s, you but would have you would have it would have been expressed in completely it would different have been the same thing, no matter how it was expressed. Well, the mood the, the mood would have been the same, but it would only have been the mood that was the same. Uh, and you're the, trying the to reject something you don't understand. That's no doubt true. I dare say it is true. But I, think I bet you that in 50 years' time, people will be quoting this kind of thing as as a, a, a symptom of the late 20th century, which will then, by then, be regarded with a certain amount of, of, of uh, humor. Well, hopefully they'll be able to express all of this better, and so it would please you more. So you better live longer then, because I, I think this is an important thing here, and if we're not expressing it exactly right, and you hope it'll be expressed better, but it's not going to go away. But it's but not but that in 40 years people are going to think differently sorry. and make fun what, of this. What That's what not what I was just, no, absolutely not making fun, but I was w wondering if, if one is absolutely brutally reductive and rational about it, is it just not true that since the dawn of time, mankind has sought to confer some kind of meaning on the chaos of life uh, through religion or through any kind of system Mythology. of beliefs. Gods. Or they, they are, they're not trying to confer it. They're trying to see what meaning is there. But maybe the very human condition see, is to sure. never know. Is, is, there, is there a dark possibility that there the is mystery. in fact uh, any meaning there at all and that you're born and you die and you just try and sort of get on with it and and you find whatever whatever methods the the century the period the zeitgeist has to get you through it which is exactly what sure I that's think. a possibility too i mean uh, you so know well, beckett, is not, beckett is about that about i don't mean to be insulting mm -hmm. i'm sorry i didn't mean to be no but that it's, rude to you. it's, it's um, a, but it's, it's the it, idea of it being pigeonholed into a collective where i think that the the soul at some point screams so loud that it demands recognition. I mean, I'm, I'm I nowadays, uh, I I'm Stephen... nowadays a, a, a fairly kind of um, uh, unfaithful member of the Church of England, yeah. and I love it. I yeah. love sitting there, and yeah. I love hearing the hymns, yeah. and I love saying the prayers, yeah. and I don't really believe that it, it, it actually is what the future is for me. I just think it's really nice, and I wish it were true. But I think that if you have these myths, um, of which I, I'm afraid, I, I, I think probably religion is, is going to turn out to be one, it does make life a lot nicer and a lot easier and a lot more That the leaf lived happily bear. ever after, but you know, you're... Back that's what you, that's what, oh, or else you think maybe it's me, maybe I'm going to be the one that, that, that everybody else might, you know, not, but I might be the one that lives happily so ever after. So I heard Stephen Leacock, the Canadian... You can't all. Somebody's got to go. Most of them got to go. We all hope that we survive and everybody else falls off. It ain't going to happen. You know, Stephen Leacock said, uh, you know, they, the life insurance uh, people and try to get me to sign up, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, they say everyone's going to die, but, uh, you know, that's not true of me. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Why should I pay that money? Let's all go to the dressing room and drum. Come all right. <laughs> yeah. Are we done? Yeah. Well, if they survive the food, Ruby will be back Monday to Wednesday next week on BBC Two. Is it true about Danny? Sometimes the uniform can become a bit of a straitjacket, you know? Make me feel safe. Hey. Mike, what are you yeah. doing? Mike, what are you doing? Oh, this is really funny, yeah, really mature. How long are you going to leave it there, then? I don't know. Do when I'm hungry. Guys, what it's not funny. Come on, Lewis, you little princess. I'm going to try being stuck in a car with her all day long. No, I don't. Get ready for the biggest thing on television in 200 million years. Walking with Dinosaurs, October on BBC One. Talking real sax appeal now on BBC Two, Seinfeld.